right. Well, thanks for coming. Let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about a dozen cool things we can do with popular JVM languages. So one of the things I look at as languages are as vehicles. You know, there are bicycles, there are rockets, there are uh, airplanes, and absolutely we need all of them. And I see languages to be similar to that. There are certain tasks we want to do, and maybe a capability of one language is better than another to get it done. Well, what's really cool about these languages on, uh, is that we can actually run them on the JVM. We can compile the code down to bytecode, and we can use them within Java or other languages on the JVM, so we can definitely benefit from those very nicely. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to hear what you have to say along the way. So don't hesitate at all. Just draw my attention and speak up. I'll be delighted to hear what you have to say. So let's talk about a dozen cool things. I'm going to talk about a few more things in a little bit more detail than other things with the given time, but we will cover most of it right here. So let's talk about <clears throat> accessing a file. This is a very common operation we do, is to read a file. How do we normally do this in Java? Well, I, I know I, I don't want to do it in front of you because nobody would dare to do that here in public. But, but the point really is that if you want to do this, you would have, you, you'd have to open a file. You have to go through and start reading while string is not equal to null. That's a smell. Of course, in Java 8, we have a much better solution. We could just use the files and then get the path and then read from it. But even then, there's one thing that's going to really absolutely make things worse for us, which is dealing with the checked exception. When everything is said and done, you forget why you wanted to open the file in the first place. Well, the good news is we don't have to struggle really that hard. So let's take a look at a couple of examples right in here. So this is an example I'm going to show you in Groovy. So I'm going to simply say print line new file. And I'm going to simply say sample.groovy, which is the same file we have here. And when I run this code, you can see it's just a file object. But then I can simply say text over here, and you can see how easy it is to read the content of the file right there. So languages can give us abilities to improve on the library to add functions. And Java is heading in this direction as well. If you look at Java 12, there are a few interesting functions. And this is going to only get better. But I would argue some of these languages are heavily influencing where Java is moving as well. That's an example in Groovy. On the other hand, if I were to take Scala for a minute, I could say, for example, here, io.source.from file right there, and I can specify sample.scala right here, just read the same file where this content is. I'm going to concatenate all of that using a make string right there, and you can see that this particular uh, code is producing the same result as that file itself, and you can see the output right there displaying the content of that one single uh, line of that file very easily. Similarly, in Kotlin, you can use a read text for you. So for example, this is Kotlin code, if you will. I can say new, in this case, of course, java.io file, and then of course this can be a sample uh, .kts, that's the extension I have for the Kotlin script. I'm going to say read text right in here, and that is Kotlin code reading the content of the same file right there. That's pretty darn simple as you can see. So languages can really provide library of functions to make our life a lot easier. It doesn't take a lot of effort to do it. Let's move on to the next thing I want to talk about here, which is to interact with an external process. But here is a, a small story I'll share with you. Uh, it's been a few years now, but I remember working on a program where I had to make a call to an external process, uh, send some input, get some output, process it. And the entire code, in all honesty, was about 200 lines of code. But once I got it working, I was curious, so I went, went back to look at the code. And I was a little shocked because of the 200 lines of code, about 75 lines of code was simply to talk to this file, uh, to this external process to get the input and then get that running. And I was thinking, you know, 75 lines of code in a program which is only 200 lines of code, think about the signal to noise ratio in there, which is pretty bad. And programmers will tell you secretly, it's a lot more fun to rewrite code than to reuse code. So I decided to rewrite this whole code again. And this time around, the uh, code to talk to an external process was a mere three lines of code. Let's see how. Let's say I want to just talk to git. Let's do something really simple and trivial. Maybe all I want to do is, like I would do on a command prompt, if you will. For example, let's say all I want to do is to simply call git. But in this case, maybe I'll just run, uh, let's say, git help, something like that. Well, if all I'm going to do is run git help, but obviously I don't want to run that from the command line like I'm doing right now, but maybe wanna, what I want to do is to run this from within a process itself, how would I go about doing it? So here we go. So I'm going to start with the print line, and I simply say git help, and as we know, it's merely a string. That's what I'm doing right here in Groovy. But what Groovy has done is it's taken the strings and added a method to the string, which is called the execute method. And notice all of a sudden we get a process object on our hand. 
And then, of course, I can call text on it, and I can get the standard output of Git right there, so you can see how easy it is to interact with the external process, and then put a, a couple of more lines around it to really send the input and get the output. Life becomes really easy, as you can see. So the job of really interacting with the external process, even though it is still using the JDK, becomes a lot easier thanks to some of these benefits you get. But of course, let's also play a, you know, a good objective game here. Java also has come along a very long way doing some wonderful things. So for this, I want to talk about a beautiful pattern called the execute around method pattern. This is one of my favorite patterns when it comes to using the functional style of programming. But before we talk about this pattern, let's understand a, a, a problem we want to solve. Let's say we have a class called resource, if you will, and the resource class contains a constructor. Let's say all that the constructor is going to do is to simply output, let's say, create it for a minute. And then I want to have a function within here. Let's call it op1. And all I'm going to do in op1 is simply output, let's say, op1. So that's good enough for now. Now let's say we want to create an object of this resource. So I say resource is equal to new resource. And I'm going to call the object op1 right there. But imagine for a minute that this resource uses an external resource, like maybe a file that's open, a database connection that's open, a web service, or something that's open, and you want to release that particular external resource. Now, we know one thing very sure in Java. Java has automatic garbage collection. But unfortunately, though, the automatic garbage collection in Java is automatic, but not instantaneous. In a way, the garbage collector in Java is like the garbage collector in my neighborhood. Just just because I put the trash out doesn't mean they come and get it. So the point really is it runs whenever it wants to run, if it wants to run. So as a result, there's no guarantee when the garbage collector will actually run. But what did Java do in, it, in terms of its initial design? They decided to tie two things that shouldn't be tied together, and they provided a method called finalize method. And in the finalize method, you can say uh, something like clean up external, let's say, resource. Now, if they were to rename the finalize method, a good name for it would be bad idea. Because this was a terrible function to be providing in the first place, because there was no guarantee when the finalize method would actually be called, because it will be called if and when the garbage collector collects the garbage. Now, of course, they took a very bold step in Java 9. In Java 9, they deprecated the finalize method. I'm so happy for that. So moving forward, of course, we have very little incentive to use it. But of course, the question is, what do we do to use the, you know, instead of finalize method? Now, here's the problem, though. If I go back and run this code, you get the warning for the deprecation. But more important, if you look at the output of this code, notice it did not call the finalize method. So what do you do to get around it? You know, the creators of Java have a very you know, dry sense of humor. And I always look at them and admire for doing such a villainous act in the programming. And one of the things they provided was this beautiful method called GC. And this is so cool, because when you run it, nothing actually happens. And, and this is great. And, and the, if they want to rename this method, a better name for this would be hope, actually. That would have been a better name for this method, GC, because you can only hope that it'll do anything, but it doesn't. That's a really, you know, a really bad humor, in my opinion, that they decided to do it. So what do you do about it? Well, not only they deprecated the finalized method, they came up with a brilliant idea to solve this problem, which is called ARM. And ARM stands for Automatic Resource Management. So before I talk about this solution, I'll share with you one experience I had. I had a client of mine call me one day and said, we have a problem in production. Maybe you can come and help us. Why don't you uh, review the code? And then while you review the code, maybe you can find the problem and help us to fix it. And I was very curious. I went to the boss and said, can you tell me what the problem is? And the boss said, don't bother me. Go talk to the programmers. They will give you the details. But the funny part was the programmers would just simply not tell me what was wrong. I would go to one programmer at, uh, after another, and I would say, your boss told me there's a problem in production. Can you tell me what? And they would say, no, I don't know what the problem is, and nobody would tell me, until one person nailed it. And he said, oh, yes, everything works fine most of the time. I said, that's awesome. Can you please tell me maybe when it doesn't work? And he said, oh, of course. Things don't work normally between 7.15 and 9 in the morning. I said, oh, my goodness, every day. He said, no, only Monday through Friday. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what does this even mean? So I said, thanks for that. Very helpful. I'll come back to you later. Then I started code reviewing, and I found the reason why there was a problem. 
Honestly, what they had done was, in the constructor of their object, they had opened up a connection to a database. And you know where this is going? In the finalized method, they had written the code to release the connection uh, or close the connection from the database. And the minute I saw this, I'm like, oh my goodness, I know what's going on here. You guys put code in finalize. You should never use finalize. And you, you, here you have a code to release the database connection in the finalized method. No wonder things don't work. And all I did was I wrote a close method. And then, of course, I came in here in the bottom and I said resource.close. And of course, when you run the code, it did the garbage collection of the external resource. And I had a developer sitting there looking at the system and he said, oh, look, the database connections were growing before. Now it's really flat. Yeah, this is awesome. But the real fun part was that afternoon when the boss came back from lunch because I could see him, hear him talk in the other room. And the developers were very eager to tell him, you know the problem we've been having for a long time? We've got a great new for you, we fixed it. And he said, really, what do you guys do? Oh, Venkat asked us to write one line of code, we wrote it, and the problem was gone. And then he said, really, what else did he do? They're like, no, nothing, he just wrote this one line and the problem is gone. And there was a long pause, and then I heard, you know, hear him ask, well, if you only wrote one line of code, do we still need to pay him? Well, uh, absolutely, right? So the point really is, in this case, that this is still not a good solution because there could be potentially an exception in the code and the close may never get called, so what are we going to do? So we could say, for example, try block right in here. We could call the resource.open within this, and then, of course, in the final E block, we could simply say we could uh, provide the close method call in here. But there's two problems now in this code. The first problem is while that code is working, the first problem is that we may forget to call the close in the first place. Secondly, we may forget to call the try also. And third, this code is really verbose. So how could we solve, did I say two problems off by one error? So we can see that there are three problems at least in this code. How do we solve that problem? Well, this is what Java 9 did. Java 9 introduced the so-called automatic resource management. So what do you do in this approach? Well, you can reduce the verbosity of the code a little bit. So to decrease the verbosity, what you can do is you can say implements auto-closable right in here. And of course, the auto-closable simply has one method in it, which is the close method itself. Now what you can do is you can go in here, and then of course, you can use the try with the resource right in there. And then of course, you can simply call the op method, but you don't have to waste your time and effort writing the finally block. So when you run the code, of course, you can see that the close is called automatically for you. So this is an improvement in Java 7 with Java 9 deprecating the final, finalized method. This is a good direction, isn't it? Well, almost. Now you can see that in this case we use the ARM, the automatic resource management. So you implement auto closable, write the close method, and then you can put this in the try block. All this is great. So it does make the code less verbose. But here's the question though. What if you're writing code on a given day and let's say you forgot to really put that in the try block and you wrote the code like this? Let's think about this for a minute. You used ARM, you implemented auto-closable, you have the close method, and the compiler knows about it, so let's take a guess. The compiler will give you an error at this point. What do you think, true or false? False, that's correct, unfortunately. It'll give you at least a warning. What do you think? No. What does it do? Well, deep down in your heart, you know the answer for this question. That is, you never trust a feature with the word management in its name. So the point really is, it doesn't do anything except it blames you for forgetting to write that method. So how do you really make this deterministic? How do you make sure this not doesn't happen accidentally? Well, enters not ARM, but the EAM, which is execute around method pattern. So what I'm going to do here is to get rid of that implements auto-closable. Forget about that for a minute. Let's come in here to this code, and maybe you even call a close method, which is incorrect, but let's entertain this thought for a minute. Now what I'm going to do is to make the close method a private method. Now clearly because close is private, you cannot call close on line number 15. Maybe the programmer doesn't care calling it. What are we going to do next? 
Well, the next thing we're going to do is to take the constructor and make the constructor private as well. Now, of course, line number 13 does not compile what gives, what do we do, how do we solve this problem? Enters the execute around method pattern. So this is a pattern I came across in a very old book called Small Talk Best Practices. And there's a book by Ken Beck. He talks about how you can use lambdas to build this particular pattern. I was very intrigued by it, and I'm applying here in Java. So what I'm going to do is public static use method, and within the use method, I'm going to simply say that I'm going to create a resource object right in here, and once I create a resource object, I can remember to put a try block around it because I'm the author of this class after all, and I know what I'm trying to really design into this. And I'm going to then say finally block over here, and I'm going to say resource.close and, and clean up the resource of this object appropriately. But within the try block, on the other hand, I can simply say block block.accept, and then I can pass the resource we created to the block. Now, obvious question is, what in the world is this block? Well, to answer that question, let's go ahead and import java.util.function.star. And in this case, we will bring in a consumer of resource, and we'll call this a block. So essentially, what the use method is doing is the use method receives a consumer as its parameter. It creates an object of resource, passes the resource within the safety haven of the try block to the block. And then, of course, whether it comes back alive or dead, it it cleans up the resource for you automatically. Now, of course, we need to use the use method. How do I do that on line number? Let's look at the line number 11 for a minute. Of course, this is going to be a void method. But line number 13, what am I going to do, which was earlier, it is line 24 now. So resource.use, and we call the use method here in this, in this using code. Then we receive a resource object, and then we simply say resource.op1, and we can call the method on it right in there. So notice how the lambda expression now receives the resource as a reference, invokes the method it wants to invoke. Potentially, you may have yet another method on this class as well. So for example, if you were to have, let's say, another method, let's say op2, which is doing some other operation, you could potentially design this in a way that these can return a resource as an object. So we can say return this from both of those calls. Then what you can do here is to come in here and say resource.op1, and then you can say op2, and you can call multiple of these methods on this particular object. And you can see that it invokes those methods, but it cleans up the resource automatically for you when you are done with it. So the benefit of this approach, which is called the execute around method pattern, is that you want to execute your code, but around that code, you want to perform a pre-op and a post-op. So essentially what you're doing here is you enter in and you do the preparation work, initializing your resources, if you will, and then you pass the object to whatever method that wants to use the object, and then when you're done with it, you perform the cleanup operation, and that becomes your execute around method. In the case of language like Scala, they call it a loan pattern. This is as if the object is given to you in loan, and you can make use of it, so that's another way to really think about it in terms of the power of this particular feature. So we looked at the execute around method pattern and how we can use that to manage these resources and not be worried about forgetting to do this properly. So this kind of gives you a channel to focus on and guides you along a certain way to implement the code properly so the programmers can benefit from it really nicely. So the next thing I want to talk about here is about traits just a little bit. I won't spend too much time on this. And, and the thing I want to talk about traits is in Scala, we don't have interfaces. We have traits. So what are traits really? Well, at the very first thought, you could say a trait compiles down to an interface. Well, big deal. If traits can be there in Scala, we can have interface in Java. What's the difference? Well. In the, in the case of Scala, this was way back in time, uh, even before Java 8 was around. In the case of Scala, traits can have implementations of methods as well. Now you may observe and say, yeah, that was a great idea back then, but now Java 8 gives us default methods, so what's the big deal? Well, that's a very reasonable question to ask, and the answer to that question is, one of the cool things about traits that Java doesn't still do is that traits are stackable. And that's what really excites me about traits is traits are really stackable. So what does it really mean, uh, traits are stackable? What that means is an object could implement a particular trait, but you can bring in multiple implementations of the traits together, and it forms a chain like a train, if you will. 
And so as a result, you can start calling a method which can propagate through different implementations. So it forms a nice decorator pattern, if you will. And as a result, you can use traits to build the stackability very nicely, something you cannot do really that easily in Java today, but you can do with traits. And the reason is traits really are compile time implementation of the mixin concept in object oriented programming. So if you're interested in that further, take a look at traits. Uh, traits also, you may Google for uh, a talk called Story of traits where I dig in deep into it for a good 90 minutes or so, so you can take a look at more of those things. Well, coming back to Java, I do want to talk about one really cool feature that is available in Java, which is available in other languages as well, but Java nicely has that. Let's think about what this is in just a minute. Let's say we are given a string of names over here, and I have a list of names, let's call it as some names over here. The problem given to us is print, let's say, comma, separated. And it says, in uppercase, let's say, names of length, let's say, four. Well, that's a very simple problem. Comma separated, uppercase, names of length four. How do you do this? Well, here's an idea. We could say string name comes from names, of course. And then I could say if name dot length over here, and if the name's length is equal to, let's say, four, well, what do I want to do then? All I want to do is simply output name.2 uppercase and, and print this value right here in uppercase. That's a good start, but it requires that we print it comma separated, but we all know what it really means comma separated. It's got to be on the same line. But when you run this code, you get this output, but did you notice there is a stupid comma in the very end? Has anyone seen this problem before, right? And when it happened to you, how did you feel about it? You're like, my God, this is not happening to me, right? And then you looked at it for a few minutes, and you said, no big deal. I can still work with it. I'm going to remove that comma. And then you realize, damn it, the string is immutable. Then what do you do? Then you come up with a brilliant idea. You say, hey, why don't we use a string builder? And your colleague says, is it string buffer or string builder? And you have a 30-minute discussion about which one should you use. Well, looks like this is not an easy problem to solve. You're scratching your head. And finally, somebody says, you know what, dude? Why are you struggling with this so hard? There's a very simple answer to it. Really, what is it? Just don't print the comma if that is the last element. Why didn't I not think about it? How do you know it's the last element? Very easy. All you have to do is go back here and say, int i equal to zero. How do you feel about that? 20 minutes later, you're still working on it. In the meantime, the boss comes to you and says, how's it going, right? And th this is the life of a programmer, isn't it? Well, simple things must be simple, and you know, more difficult things to, should be affordable. How do we do this? Well, here's an idea. Let's start with this, first of all, and say names.stream. And I want to do a filter operation, given a name. I want to say name.length is equal to, let's say, 4. Great. I want to perform a map of string to uppercase. So we got all the st uh, uh, strings of length 4 in uppercase. Then I call the collect method. Now, the collect method is going to use what is called a collectors. And, and I, I want to encourage you to think about collectors. Collectors is probably one of the most intriguing classes in the JDK, hands down, in my opinion. And I've been looking at collectors for a while. The more I learn, the more there is to learn. I was so intrigued by it. In fact, one of the talks I'm going to give in this year's uh, code one is actually just an entire talk on just focusing on the collectors. It's one of those cool uh, you know, uh, uh, classes to look at. But collectors has a beautiful method called joining. And you can simply use the joining and look at the beauty of that code. Honestly, the day I learned about joining, I cried that night. This is the way the programming should really be, isn't it? Because it just gets work done. It's a functional style approach. You can read the code, and it's so intuitive. Given a collection of names, give me all the names which are of length four, convert to uppercase, and then you know, uh, join them with a the comma separation, and that becomes a lot easier to work with. So that is an example of how we can actually uh, use this beautiful feature to uh, use uh, you know, code to join things, and we can do very effectively. 
Well, the next thing I want to show you here uh, quickly is a beautiful concept of lazy evaluation. What is really cool about this is it is done using a keyword in the case of uh, Scala, but it is using a beautiful concept of delegation in Kotlin. So I'll show you both of those here really quickly to get a feel for it. So let's go to Scala here for a minute. Let's write a function called compute, where the compute function takes an integer value. I'm going to simply say called and assume this is a time-consuming operation. Well, it's really not, but let's assume that. So the compute method is sitting right in here. This is a code in Scala, as you can see. Then I'm going to say x is equal to 4. But then what I want to do here is, given this value of x, what I want to do is to simply say if x is greater than 5 and the compute of x is greater than 7, I want to say print line path 1. Otherwise, I'm going to simply say else, and I'm going to say print line path 2. Well, that's a very simple code, but before I run the code, a quick quiz for you. Will the compute function be called right now? What do you think? No, of course not. And that's a, why, why would it be called? What's that feature called? We all know that. That's correct, short-circuiting. You may wonder, who in the world created short-circuiting? Well, this is so pervasive. I would say short-circuiting is a tribal knowledge in our field. Everybody knows about short-circuiting, isn't it? Moms feed their children and tell them, when you grow up and if you ever become a programmer, watch out for short-circuiting. Well, that's because John McCarthy introduced this as part of Lisp, and it's been ever in every single language since then. So when I run this code, of course, as you would expect, it did not call the compute method. But unfortunately, though, there's a little problem in this code. If I really wanted to use the compute to display the result over here, I'm going to say compute of x right there, but you know the consequences of writing this code. The good news is it's not called. The bad news is if it ever going to get called, it gets called twice in this case, which is not a good thing. So what am I going to do to remove that particular problem? What I'm going to do is to take this compute from here and call it temp, and I'm going to go back and put this as temp here as well, and then I say val temp is equal to compute. Well, that seems like a reasonable optimization so that we don't call the compute method twice. But you know the consequence of making this change in this code. Unfortunately now, even though we shouldn't be calling the compute method, we end up calling it. Why is that? The reason is Scala says, well, I want to call this method even though you are not using temp. And the reason is, what if this method has a side effect? Now you may say, wait a minute. The compute method had a side effect before. Why didn't you call this in a short circuit situation? But why are you calling it now? The shortest answer to that question is language specification. What does language specification mean? It means don't argue about it. So the, essentially, languages will make up stuff, and they will just do things because that's what they want to do. Well, in the case of languages, it's a foregone conclusion that even a function were having a side effect, it will not get called in a certain situation, but in other situations, they may end up calling. Well, you may tell Scala, you know what? Fair enough, that's your rule, but I've got a suggestion for you. Why don't you just skip it? Don't bother calling it. So you can mark it as a lazy lazy as you can see. And by marking it lazy, you can see that it did not call it. On the other hand, if x is greater than uh, 5, when you run the code, you can see it did call called, but it called it exactly once. And to make it clear, I'm going to say here, and you can see that it's going to call the method compute, not on line number 7, but really on line number 9, as you can see. So it defers the evaluation until a later time. That's an example of how you can use lazy evaluation in the case of Scala. On the other hand, let's go to Kotlin for a minute. I'm going to create a function called compute right in here. And then in this case, of course, I'm going to say this returns an integer. But this time, I'm going to simply say called, as you would expect. But then in this function, I'm going to simply return n times 2. So something very similar to what we did in Scala here in the case of Kotlin. But I'm going to say if x is greater than, let's say, 5, and end, I'm going to say temp, where I'm going to say val temp is equal to compute of, let's say, x. Then, of course, I'm going to say over here, print line will say path 1 uh, width, and I'm going to print the value of temp. Otherwise, I'm going to simply say else, and let's go ahead and just print over here a path 2. 
Now, the good news in this code is we are using the temp and reusing it. But the bad news, of course, is it's going to call that uh, a couple of different times. So of course, temp is greater than 7, let's say. And it's going to call it uh, one time here, even though it is not needed. So what can we do? Well, before we talk about how to do it, one of the beautiful things in Kotlin is, Kotlin is one of those languages that provides both uh, delegation and inheritance as a first class citizen. So in the case of Kotlin, you can use delegation by using a, a keyword called by, where you can delegate to another implementation. So I can say temp by lazy, and then you can simply route it. Lazy is actually not a keyword in the case of Kotlin. It's a function in the library. By is actually the keyword because it's used to delegate in, in the case of Kotlin, and you are able to route to it. So in this case, when I run the code, you can see that it is bypassing the call to compute. It did not call the compute. On the other hand, if this were x is equal to 14, you can see the compute is called exactly once in this case. So a very similar idea here in Kotlin, you can use the lazy evaluation both in Scala and Kotlin, and you can benefit from some of those uh, nice little things. Well, that's great so far, but let's explore a few other interesting capabilities. I'm a huge fan of pattern matching in languages like Erlang, Haskell, Scala, Kotlin. Now, of course, we know in Java, we're going to have these capabilities in Java uh, 13 and 14. So by the time we get to Java 15, we'll have some really cool features like the ones I'm going to show you here. But here in the case of Kotlin, I want to show you some beautiful pattern matching capability. So let's say we create a function called process, which is going to take an input. We'll call this as any type. And what I want to do within this is use a when. A when is available both as an expression and as a statement in the case of Kotlin. Here I'm using it as a statement. We'll say when input, what do I want to do? I'll simply say else over here, and I'm going to simply print out whatever. So I don't really care about what it is at the moment. We'll call process with a 1. Let's call process with, let's say, a, third, a 14. Let's call process with, let's say, a hello, and see where this uh, takes us. So when I execute this code, it gives a warning that input is not being used, but it said whatever for all the three values. That's quite a good start. Let's go a little further with this. I'm going to say 1 and simply say 1 over here. So in this case, you can see the value is printed as 1 when you pass a 1 to it. But what's really cool about this is you can also say 13 to 19, and you can print out a teen, for example. So when I pass a 14, it actually ends up displaying a teen for us, as you can see. That's what it's supposed to do. Well, of course, in this case, in. And you can see that in this case, it tells you it's a teen, as you can see. Similarly, I can say is a string, and I could simply print out a string over here, and you can see the output simply tells you it's a string. So it removes a lot of verbosity in the code and makes it easy to perform the pattern matching, as you can see. So that's a very powerful way. You can compare against an object's value. You can compare objects in a range of values. You can also compare, for example, if it's a certain type, and that makes life really easy. And that's an example in Kotlin, but you can similarly do things in Scala and eventually in Java as well. But having said that, one of the things I look for in languages is where the language can remove a lot of ceremony for us. Let's think about Java for just a minute. Imagine I write this code in Java where I have a static, let's say, void process, and this process function takes an object, let's say, input. And in this case, I'm going to simply output the given value. Let's start with that little example. I call process with a 1, and I call process with a string, let's say, hello. Now, when I run this code this time, all it's going to do is print 1 and hello. But imagine right in here, I'm going to say if, and I say input instance of, let's say, string. Well, given that it's a string, I'm going to simply output got a string. Well, that's good so far, isn't it? Not a problem. But then I want to say off length. And then I'm going to say over here a plus, And then I'm going to say input dot length. Would that work? No, of course not. You know this is a Java programmer. Because in Java, you get to write some beautiful code like this. You will say over here, string like this. And now Java says, we are the best buddies, keep going. Now, does anyone remember what this feature is called? <laughs> 
Yeah, you call it casting, I call it punishment. Because what this is doing is, it is punishing you. You simply said, is it a string? Yes, get me its length. And the Java says, get what's length, right? So it is not really very intelligent in terms of how you communicate, isn't it? Now, I always wonder about this question when I program in languages like this, uh, do you work for the compiler or does the compiler uh, work for you? Uh, in the case of Java, I work for the compiler. The compiler comes to me and says, you need to do all of this. And you're like, can I go to lunch? And Java says, no lunch for you. Get this working. I'll go to lunch instead. Well, the point really is that you have to put all that effort in ceremony. Well, eventually, of course, Java will remove that burden from us. But like, like what? Well, here's an example. I am here in this code in Kotlin, and I'm going to say a string of length right here, and then I put a immediately input.length right there, and I run the code. And notice the output says a string of length 5. So what did we just do? Well, you paid the toll once. You asked Kotlin compiler, can you tell me if it's a string? And it said, oh, yes, it's a string. And now you say, get me its length. And make no mistake, this is not going to let you do it elsewhere. So for example, if I were to say input.length right here, I get the yelling from the compiler saying, what are you trying to do? Error, there is no method called, property called length. So absolutely, I cannot call that from here. But on the other hand, I can call this from here because it's called the smart casting. So a smart casting is very intelligent, knowing the context it knows that the reference is really of type string at the time and allows you to call that method, but only within the branch of the code and not elsewhere. Well, the good news is we should be able to do this in Java eventually when Java you know, implements this feature, but these things can remove the verbosity in your code and make our life a lot easier, as you can see. Well, that's great so far, but let's talk about dealing with XML. Well, uh, from time to time, we do have to write code to deal with XML. Suppose we have a langs over here, and let's say this langs contains a few different languages. Let's say Java over here, and let's map Java to maybe the creator of Java. We'll say Goslin right here. We'll just put one more here. Let's say uh, over here is Ruby, and we'll map that to, let's say, Mots over here. Well, great. Let's start with that. Now, what if I'm told that there's some data coming in, and I need to create a piece of code that generates XML from this data? Anyone here who has ever written code to generate XML before? Yeah, a few of us. I know how reluctantly people are raising the hand, but the others know never to raise hand in public, right, uh, for this question. Well, but what, what the, for those who are brave enough to raise the answer, uh, raise the hand, uh, are you so eager to go write more of that code tonight? No, not a single person raised the hand this time. Well, the reason is, of course, the minute you write the code to write XML, you quickly realize that the job of writing code to write XML should be given to people in the prison. No, nobody in the free world should be forced to do this. But you don't have to really work this hard. You can do it very easily. The only thing you have to remember is never tell the boss about this. Tell the boss it takes a lot of time, get it done in 10 minutes, and then go have a good time in the, at the beach. So here's a way to do this. You can simply say over here, builder is equal to new groovy.xml.markup builder. So I create a markup builder right in there. Then I simply say at this point, builder.languages, and that's all I did, nothing really more. Now, as soon as I run this code, you will notice a small XML baby just pop out. So that's a really how simple it is to really write that little code to write that little XML content. But then you can go one level of indentation. This is a DSL to create XML documents. So you could be writing code in Java, but quickly branch off and write some bytecode in Groovy, uh, 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 code in Groovy and compile it to bytecode, and then integrate with your Java code if you want to do this. So if I say language, over here, notice the nested element right in there. But instead of that, if I were to go langs.each and put that inside of that, you can see two of those pop up right there. But then we can go back over here and say, given a key and a value, I can then take the key and value, and I can simply say over here, name is the key, and I can create an attribute with that particular value. And similarly, I could say author and provide the value to it, and as a result, without much effort, we can start creating XML documents with different 
certain hierarchy, and that becomes a lot easier for us to work with. And that's one example of how we can use a DSL syntax to create XML documents very easily without much effort at all. And then, of course, you can tie that to a file and dump it to a file or send it across a standard output, whatever that you may want to do. You can do that pretty effectively. Well, two other three other concepts I want to quickly talk about in the next about 10 minutes we have with us. And one of them is a beautiful implementation of a tail call optimization. Now, unfortunately, though, Java does not have tail call optimization today. If you really want to, you can do that with your own library of functions in Java. But in the case of language like Scala, this is done for you at the compiler level. But before we talk about it, I want to mention quickly about SICP, which stands for Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And this is a beautiful book used in MIT. If you just Google for this, you will find it if you're not familiar with this. Just Google for the word SICP book. And, and it's a beautiful book. And in this book, they talk about a couple of different things. They talk about process versus a procedure, or rather, a procedure. Uh, so procedure versus a process. So what do they mean by this? A procedure is the code you write. A process is the code that actually executes. Now, you may write, for example, an iteration. And then when it runs, it may run as an iteration. That's a no-brainer. Or you may write the code as a recursion, and it may run as a recursion, and that's also pretty straightforward. But a real benefit is when you can write as a recursion, but at the runtime it runs as an iteration. Then you can get the best of both worlds. Why is that? Well, we all know recursion is very intriguing. You probably remember the day you learned about recursion. How did you feel when you learned about recursion? I bet you, you had a recursion party that night. You invited all your friends and said, let me share with you what I learned. This can be recursive. And your party was going really well, but there's always this one person who everybody hates, isn't it? And that person comes to you and says, oh, really, you think recursions are cool, huh? And why don't you try running with this big value, and your code ends up with a stack overflow error, and the party gets over. How terrible that is. Well, what if you can write a recursion, but can run it all the time without ever getting a stack overflow error? Let's take a look at an example to see how we can potentially do this. So I'm going to write a factorial function right here. Let's take with the value n uh, as an integer. And what I want to do within this code is return a big integer. And, and within the implementation, I'm going to say if n is less than 2, let's say return 1. Otherwise, what am I going to do? Well, else what I want to do in this code is use the recursion and say return factorial of n minus 1, uh, you know, n times factorial of n minus 1. So let's start with this little example to begin with. So I'm going to say factorial of 1, let's say. Obviously, factorial of 1 should be a 1. Let's make sure that we are doing this properly. So it's, it's illegal start of declaration, let's say. Where am I? It's in Scala. So if n is less than 1, what I want to do is to return the value of 1. Otherwise, I want to return the value of n times factorial of n minus 1. Oh, it's a big integer, right? So big int of 1, that's what I want to really return. And otherwise, I want to simply return the value itself. Not sure exactly what I'm messing with here uh, in this particular code, but I want to just check for that particular value and execute this code. Let's start with, well, let's kind of get down to the basics and see what it's doing. I want to just return a big int of 1. Let's see if that oh, uh, gets through. Of course, I need to put a return statement right now. That's what it's complaining about. Let's do that. So return. So, so this is going to to give us a value of that. So that's going to be a big integer we're going to return. Not sure what's going on. My brain doesn't uh, think about the solution right there. Let's try this. So what I want to do is to say if n is less than 2, what do I want to do? Oh, return, in this case, a big integer of, let's say, 1. Otherwise, I'm going to simply say n times factorial of, let's say, n minus 1. Let's see if that gets us any further. OK, great. So what I want to do then is to say 5, maybe. Hey, that should be a 120. It worked. What about a 50? Well, that one works, too. What about a 500? You know, that keeps going. Don't try to memorize those results. It's kind of producing those results. And I have no clue but why I want to try 50,000. But that failed, as you can see, with the Stack Overflow error. So how sad I'm not able to use it for a bigger value, like a 50,000. So what can we do in this case? Well, what you can do is you can use what is called tail call optimization. The word here is tail call, so it's got to be in the tail call position. So what I'm going to do here is to pass in a factorial. Let's go ahead and say over here as a fact, which is a big int, 
And, and this is going to be equal to, uh, well, this is going to be an initial value, let's say, a big int of, let's say, 1 as the initial value we'll provide. Then we will say if n is less than 2, we'll return the fact as it's given to us. Otherwise, we will say uh, call factorial of n minus 1 comma, let's say, n times the factorial. So we can then write the code this way, where we can pass a value of 1. And what this is going to do is to take the value of 1 given to it, which is going to be for the integer value. And because n is less than 2, it's going to return the factorial, which is the big integer value that we are passing in here, which is the value of 1 that I want to pass in uh, to begin with. For now, let's remove this and, and try to pass a big integer here. Let's say this is big int of 1. So all this is going to do is return that value for the particular uh, value given to it. Let's see what it's complaining. Uh, it says unapplied uh, method. Let's see, convert it to, uh, let's give it one more try here. Uh, not exactly sure. So let's kind of move on a little bit further. So this case, of course, the tail call position is the factorial. And you're going to say, take the n minus 1, and then pass the n times factorial, and pass it to this particular value. And so you can multiply it and pass it. Well, the benefit of doing this approach would be that you are able to call this with bigger values as time goes on without being bogged down. And, and that gives you an ability to really use a, a, a recursion uh, to the fullest extent. So what does the compiler do at this point? What the compiler does is the compiler will take this piece of code and rewire this at compile time as a regular iteration using a loop under the hood. So you will never get the stack overflow exception. And that is one of the biggest benefits you'll get out of it. To make this work, of course, you can also use a tail rec as an annotation. And this will guarantee that the call is at the tail call position, and you can get a benefit of that. So if you're interested in that, play with that a little bit further and take a look at it. Well, I want to talk about two other very cool features, in this case in Kotlin. And one of them is extension functions. I'm a huge fan of extension functions uh, in other languages. But in the case of Groovy, for example, you can do this using meta programming, which is really, really cool. But you are really messing with a few other things like bytecode level. And Kotlin achieves this without touching your bytecode. So what Kotlin does is when you write an extension method, they literally write a static method. They don't touch your bytecode at all. And then when the compiler sees the call to it, they quietly turn around and call a static method behind the scenes. So let's take a look at an example of how we can benefit uh, from this in, in the case of Kotlin. So I'm going to create a string. Greet is equal to, let's say, hello. And I'm going to simply print greet right in there. And you can see the function greet. And this is an object of string, obviously, in this case. So I'm able to print the value of greet. But however, I'm also going to call greet right now. But imagine for a minute that you're meeting a longtime friend after a very long time. Well, you're not going to whisper hello to them. You're going to scream hello. So I would like to you know, show that by calling the shout method. Now, in this case, when I run the code, how sad we get an error saying shout is not a method. But I think we all will agree that shout is a very important method to have in a string class. But you don't have to take no for an answer. You can go to Kotlin and say, hey, Kotlin, I think we should really have a shout method. So you can simply say string. And, and to the string, you can add what is called a shout method right in there. So this gives you an ability for you to inject a method into a class. And so you can write your own functions for the classes you are interested in. And so in a sense, what you're doing here is to uh, add a method to a class at will. So I'm going to simply say two uppercase right in here. And, and so all I'm going to ask it to do is to return the uppercase when it calls this method. So this is an example of adding a method called shout to the string class. Now, when you look at this code, this reminds me of one experience I had. I was giving a talk uh, in a conference, and there was somebody kind of sitting like where you are sitting. And this person was absolutely excited when I showed this code. And he immediately interrupted and said, can you try something else for me, he said. And, and that was, he wanted to take to lowercase, and he wanted to assign that to uh, uppercase. So in this case, when you call to lowercase over here, it is actually going to give you uppercase. Now, what really bothered me was not the fact that Kotlin allowed you to do this. 
What bothered me was how exciting this programmer was when he found out you could actually do this. We had to restrain him and send cops with him when he went home. This is kind of dangerous, so don't do this. But this can be really powerful to be able to add methods, domain-specific methods to your own code, so the code becomes a lot more meaningful for your own specific domain. Uh, I worked in the insurance company where we started adding methods to the date class for us to check if a particular insurance is valid so that can become very convenient and fluent. Talking about fluency, the last example I want to show you here is something that can help us to create internal DSLs uh, in Kotlin. So let's say we have a class called pizza, and the class pizza has a method called spread, which takes a topping, let's say, over here. And all I'm going to do at this point is simply print out, let's say, spread, and we'll spread the topping given to us. So you could say pizza is equal to a new instance of pizza, and you can say pizza.spread let's say, uh, cheese uh, sauce on it. And then, of course, I want to say pizza.spread, and let's say cheese on it. And finally, I love olives. Let's say spread uh, olives on it also. Well, while that code is really OK, what would be nice is to remove some of the noise. Well, here's the good news already, isn't it? You didn't have to put that stupid semicolon at the very end. So that itself is a big benefit already in terms of reducing the noise. But what you can do here is you can remove that space, you can remove that parenthesis, and you can remove that parenthesis from here too. But of course, that doesn't work, but Kotlin gives you a clue about it and says something about infix. So what you can do is mark this function as infix, and now when you come back and run the code, you can see you can get that fluency. So this can lead you to creating very fluent code, and that can lead you to create nice fluent DSLs as well. So I showed you 12 different things you can do with these JVM languages. Pretty exciting stuff. You can mix and match these languages with your Java code. You can uh, benefit from some of these capabilities. If you want to download the code examples, point your cameras at that URL, and uh, then you can download the code example from that uh, URL. I hope that was useful. Thank you.